This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. As a child, Merle Hoffman dreamed of a life as a warrior, but she didn't know then that her sword would be a wire hanger and the battle would be for women's freedom. This relentless champion of women, defender of abortion rights, and pioneer in women's health care for more than 40 years is my guest today, and I'm very pleased and welcome. It's a pleasure to be with you, Ronnie. <laughs> so you're back in the news again. I'm back in the news. Um, Choices. Let's talk about choices. Yes. It, it's, you started Choices. In 1971, 1971, which was two years before 41. the Supreme Court legalized abortion nationally. New York was one of the five progressive states that decriminalized between 1970 and 73. Uh, so I started it in 1971. It's a very, very small facility that served HIP, health insurance plan patients. And it was then, was it picketed? Or were, did you no, get a lot no, of attention? No, no. This was an extraordinary time because mm -hmm. you can imagine uh, there was one day when abortion was a crime. It was illegal. It was a sin. It was something discussed in philosophy or criminology classes. And then with the legalization by Roe, you know, women were lining up in the streets to have procedures. Right. So it was a radical new reality. And everything that was done was done for the first time. And and, uh, it, you know, it was an extraordinarily pioneering time in women's health and women's rights. And it was about uh, three or four or five years until the anti-choice uh, movement started to become organized enough to start to be active on the issue. Although the National Right to Life Committee was actually founded in 1969. Well, I remember when I was in college, my father was working for Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. And the battle then was to legalize the sale of contraceptives over the counter. Right. So there was still opposition. There was opposition there, but it wasn't the kind of opposition we see today. Well, I think you remember when Bill Baird, yeah. you know, tried to legalize uh, birth control in right. Massachusetts. He it's was jailed uh, for holding up a condom uh, in front of a three-month-old baby. So um, we... Um, we are actually in a, in a time in this country with this election when it seems that we're going backwards very fast. I, I always call it Groundhog Day. You know, I wake up and I think I'm, you know, still in the 1980s or even well, in the now, 50s. By now, you are running a very large women's health facility. Yes, yes. It's everything. We see 40,000 patients a year, Ronnie, and that's for family planning, gynecology, prenatal care, mental health, abortion, right. sterilization, pap smears, all sorts of women's health. It's a uh, holistic, total women's health care center. And, and you've just moved that facility. Yes. I, from, um, what, from, from Long Island City, City. I just moved it to Jamaica, uh, Jamaica, Queens, about seven months ago. And did they discover you right away? Well, or they knew. The oh, God, no. the, picketing. They, the, the picketers and the anti-choice uh, people have always known about me, and they had people outside in Long Island, well, Sister, uh, Long Island City. In fact, I write about Sister Dorothy, who is yes, a, a nun who's been out there for 15 years uh, trying to convert me, and uh, <laughs> I wish her luck it's not going to happen. <laughs> but but you, no, no. you consider this, I mean, this is a very basic freedom. It's a right that we I, I consider it a fundamental human human and civil right, Ronnie. I mean, if we can't decide when or whether to be mothers, uh, then all of our other so-called freedoms stand on brittle glass. Uh, yes, it is a human and civil right without which women cannot be full participants in society as citizens. So it is critical that this is understood and that it is codified in Roe as a constitutional right, not one that is relegated to the states, which is what the Republicans and the right wing 
king would like to have happen. And in a sense, it's like slavery, if you think about it. You can't have a free state and a slave state. Women have to be able to exercise this right in all of this country. And at this point, there are 97% of counties that have no abortion providers in this country, 97%. So people travel. They have to travel if they can afford to travel. If they can't afford to travel, they're either in a situation of, again, trying self-abortions or, you know, difficult, dangerous things, or being having children when they don't want to, which is a compulsory pregnancy as far as and I'm you, concerned. You, you talk about the constitutional uh, amendment about slavery. But also, I mean, the First Amendment is the separation of church and state. Right. That's what I've never understood. Because this is a religious belief. It's a religious belief, and then they also start to quote scientific uh, uh, studies. And uh, you know, when the fetus becomes a, a person, or when it becomes able to live outside of the womb. But I think that Roe was very wise because it recognized that in their trimester approach, and said within the first trimester, the decision is between a woman and her physician. In the second trimester. The state has a right to regulate, and in the third, only to save the life of the mother. So the court, I believe, in that wisdom, recognized that as the fetus develops, it has more of a pull on the society than in early pregnancy. So that's why, I, well, that was Blackman's thinking, yeah. and that's why I think that Roe should stand, although, you know, I, I'm not sure that it will. Is that right? You really think that it's threatened? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I mean if, uh, if, it's, if a, it's another person appointed. To the I, I ab it's, it's a five four. Thing. It's a five four decision, and I think when people think about this election, with all the issues that one has to consider, the the makeup of the Supreme Court is very critical because it's the court that's become really relatively activist. Mm -hmm. Bush v. Gore, and then you see it in Citizens United, and they're on the cusp of it's definitely so overturning. They keep saying, we don't want an activist court, but it's the most activist, of course. I would think so. Yeah. I would think so. Yeah. You know, I believe this is a generational struggle. I see the right to abortion, particularly as a power struggle, as a power and survival issue. Who is going to make that decision? Who controls women's bodies? Now, you know that the decision will be made. There's no question that women are going to have abortions, whether it's legal or whether it's illegal. The issue is whether they're going to have them in safety, compassion, and sterility, not whether they're going to have them. It doesn't stop abortion. And then all the things that come after it. So you, so you don't ha have an abortion. You have a child that you can't afford or you really didn't want or for some reason. Right. And, and no morality attached to it, just different reasons. But then the state doesn't really support you in early childhood education and giving equal cho opportunities right. to these kids. I mean, it's... It's not a pronatal society. Yeah, you see, you want to, you know, on the one hand, uh, I think we have to struggle and fight for uh, a world where women can and want to bring children into it. You know, I did a, mm -hmm. a study that I call abortionomics. And you know that 73% of women make the decision of abortion for economic reasons. They can't afford to have a child. And then you even go further into the, this data and you see, well, here are women who can't afford to have a child and then they live in an area where perhaps there's no access to birth control or perhaps they don't have insurance and it doesn't cover birth control. So they get pregnant when they don't want to be, which forces them into maybe late term abortions or self-aborting or having children that they can't afford. So it's a Kafkaesque kind of situation. But there are so many people that look at it through either a fundamentalist, religious, or ideological lens, and they don't see the reality of it, which is women's lives, women's lived experience. I mean, my first patient came to me from New Jersey. And she came from New Jersey because abortion was still illegal in New Jersey mm -hmm. in 1971. And she was uh, maybe 28 years old. She was married, white, with one child. And I held her hand during her procedure, and I'll never forget it. I mean, it was that intimate, personal connection that really um, catalyzed my, uh, my commitment to this, to this cause. So when, when uh, one of the candidates goes out and talks about that economics is the women's first major interest <laughs> in this election, economics should count first, 
um, there's no separation. Nothing, you can't separate there's no it. separation because women inherently have to be um, economic because they're usually the fulcrum of the family, <laughs> which is then the fulcrum of society. And the decisions on childbearing are so much part of an economic family unit. Yeah. Can we afford it? Can we afford one now? You know, and uh, and then obviously because of the economic situation, people out of work, people unable to get work. You know, it's really critical that yes, women do get back to work. The the country gets back to work, but who will create the policies that will support these decisions educationally, healthcare-wise, on a long-term basis? The education. Or do you find that young women uh, know enough about birth control and? Are they finding a lot of opposition from young men to using it, or no, no? I, I, I think I think there's you know a lot more awareness of uh, birth control availability, but again, that's class based, <laughs> and you know uh, who has that awareness, who has that availability and ability to purchase or to go to the doctor. There was this struggle over you know Plan B, and that that was uh, opposed uh, for teenagers. Uh, so what do you mean Plan B. Uh, that that's the uh, morning after. Plan. Oh. And there was a great brouhaha, oh, this is abortion, or, you know, and, and uh, you can't do that. So uh, how did that land up? That ended up that you can't do that. I mean, there was a big, uh, the big debate, can't. yes, uh, over the counter. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's uh, barriers to, to contraception, but the most important thing is um, I think that there has to be not only sex education, but intimacy education and relationship education. I mean, there's, uh, there's a lot of sex out there in sex education. Yeah. Right? yeah, that's interesting. So how would you go about doing that? Well, what, what we, you see, it's interesting because um, uh, in the mental health center uh, that I, uh, I had at one point in time at Choices, and I'm a psychologist by, uh, by academic training, we were seeing a lot of women who were coming in to, uh, to see the gynecologist and complaining of different symptoms, for instance, uh, insomnia or uh, difficulty in, in uh, gastrointestinal problems. And they wouldn't say or had difficulty in saying, listen, I'm in a difficult relationship or I'm being battered or I have a problem or I'm a bit. So, so we couldn't pick that up. So I developed a paradigm called disorders of intimacy and looked at relationships, you know, as if they had um, uh, a, a bell-shaped curve where people are okay in the give and take of a relationship and then skew out where the intimacy itself is problematic. And, and we work on that in relationship counseling with my counselors there. But and I think it's important, especially in, in sexuality, because you can have a diaphragm and if it's in the draw, it's not going to work and you can get pills and if you don't take them it's not going to work you know and uh, so it's important that women take responsibility for their sexuality. When, do you uh, do you have classes for nurturing? Uh, no no that I don't have yet right. but that's a good idea. Right. Yeah. It seems to me that people who who grow up in a, in a loving and more right. secure or, or an even intimate relationship right. between a parent and a child that that's so important. And that, uh, absolutely. That Absolutely, and and the importance of you know the nature of love and what that means. Um, at choices, I call the way we treat patients active loving, because so many women come into choices. Uh, you know they're in crisis and right. it's difficult, and especially if they have to walk past a gauntlet of people who are screaming, "You are killing your baby," or "You're, you know, uh, desecrating the legacy of Martin Luther King." That's even more traumatic. So. In, in a short period of time, we have to help make that woman feel that she's in an oasis, that she has support, that she has respect and dignity, right. compassion and privacy. We so have to remove that moral judgment that they feel. Absolutely, that's and that's, what, that's, that's, that's the, the issue. Basic, yeah. you see, yes, that's so important. You've hit it because, you know, look at how many women have had legal abortion since Roe and how many, how many families have been touched by it. Yeah. You know, one out of three American women will have an abortion before they're 45. Where is that constituency? Right. Where are they? Well, women don't want to say, yes, I had an abortion. But I can sit here with you and say, yes, I had an abortion. Yeah. And at the time I had it, it was the best choice for me. Right. And look at you now. Now I, yeah, at 58, I adopted <coughs> my little girl because at that point yeah. I could be a mother.
You know, but you, sometimes when you're in a room with a lot of women and you say, I think you wrote about that. Yeah. How, Anybody here have an abortion? One, 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 one will go up, up. One will, you know. Then and I'll then, say, how many people know somebody? Who has yeah, so then they all go up. Yeah, yeah you know. But yeah. but it, to own that because right. it's a it's a very strong moral decision, and women are active moral agents. And you know, there are people that say to me, oh, you know, I had an abortion and I've regretted it. And I look at them and I said, you know something, you have the right to make the wrong choice for you. <laughs> I am fighting. For your right now to make a choice, I can't guarantee that you will find in two years or five years that it was the right one. That's not my responsibility. Right. <laughs> you know, regret is a part of life. There's so many women who have children that regret that. Yeah, it's a fact. It's such a. <laughs> uh, it's such a. Um, it it's it's essentially. Well, it doesn't make women equal. We can have the Equal Rights Amendment. We can have all of these mm -hmm. things, but until we really have the right to control our own bodies, absolutely without having to feel that you've done something terrible, then we really won't be. Is that, that's basically what we're saying, right? Amen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What, I mean, how did you get into this? Oh, well, that was a very circuitous <laughs> journey. I, I uh, started out studying to be a concert pianist. My family were, uh, were musicians. Uh, then I decided to be a social psychologist. Uh, I was very apolitical. I was, when the feminist uh, movement started to rise, I was reading Nietzsche, philosophy, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, history. So I was not at all political or in the feminist, uh, you know, uh, gestalt at that point in time. But uh, as I said, I, um, I, I went to college. I had to take three jobs to put myself through college. And one of them was with the physician, Dr. Martin Gold, uh, who started with a partner he was involved in HIP, this service for mm -hmm. women, and I started it with him, and he asked me if I'd like to get involved, and it sounded very romantic, very pioneering, and I thought, oh, well, it's something, you know, no one's done before. Yeah. And after the first patient, I mean, there was, a, as it I really say, it was hooked. a catalytic event, you know, because it was so profound. I mean, here was somebody whose life spilled out and put it in my hands. And uh, she walked out and she got her life back. And that happens every day at Choices. It's happened for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of women over 40 years. And I feel privilege that I have the gift to be able, it's been given to me to be where I am, to do the work. Well, you've become such a philosopher and a, a thinker no. in, in the whole I could area not of think. movement. I, I couldn't, you know, I mean, yeah. I, I, I couldn't be there and, and hear the women see the, the, the tremendous conflict that this issue engendered in society and not, you know, go into myself and say, why am I here? Why are they here? What does this mean? What is this really about? And, you know, I went deeper and deeper. And yes, did I have doubts at certain times? I did have doubts. And after I, I thought more deeply, I became more committed. I mean, because the issue is difficult. The yeah. issue is difficult. And it's true. And the, and the more you think about it, though, the more basic you get. Yeah, it, it's, the, you know, somebody's going to make the of, choice. Is it going to be the yeah. state? Is it yeah. going to be the church? Is it going to be men in black or white robes or the legislator? No, men it's with going, white hair. Or white hair. <laughs> or even dark <laughs> or, hair. Or dark hair. Uh, no, uh, it, it's going to be the individual woman in her heart and her mind, hopefully with the... And uh, her strength. Uh huh. So nowadays, uh, you you do a lot of of speeches and I do. Stuff. Yes, I, I published uh, my book in January, Intimate Wars. So I go around and talk about it's that. It's a great book. I've Thank read you. it. I couldn't Thank put you. it down. Thank it's you. Very inspiring. Thank you. Because basically, you always wanted to do something for the good of the world or for humanity. You wanted to feel that you were involved in changing the world. I right? wanted to. I I grew up and I discovered. You know. My daughter now, she's 11, and I, I show her on television. I say, you see, that's Hillary Clinton. She's running for president. You see that? I mean, she has all yeah. of these, you know, role models. In this. I had no. no one. So I went to the library, and who did I discover? Joan of Arc and Elizabeth I. So I stuck with Elizabeth because she had 45 years of ruling the world, per se. And, and, you, and know, you were young. Kid. I was young, and it was romantic. And I, I love the idea of the power and the speeches at Tilbury and, and the great uh, accomplishment. And I wanted to lead troops into battle. I wanted to for noble causes. Right. And uh, like you said, my, uh, my 
coat hanger, my six sword. foot coat hanger became my sword. And the, the coat hanger is because people used to try to. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Their own absolutely. A coat hanger was very common. Uh, yeah, 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 that women used that to right. insert in, uh, through their vagina to the uterus. You can say vagina on this program. Of course, we can. <laughs> to their uterus to cause, uh, you know, a yeah. miscarriage. Uh, and usually, Incredible. very often, they hemorrhage to death. But then you discovered also, I think, that you have very politi very fine political skills because you're no, I think, uh, you form a lot of coalitions. Absolutely. And you work with other people. Absolutely. Even though you have this drive. <laughs> I, I, yeah, because, you know, you know I, I'll tell you, it's very interesting. I, I, I have a strong ego because you have to, to do this work. But I can definitely put it aside because, to me, the issue is key. And if I'm in a group of people and somebody comes up with a brilliant idea, it doesn't have to be me. If somebody else wants to lead us, it doesn't have yeah. to be me. It took a while to get to that point. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying I was that wise very early. I had, I had a lot of hard knocks, but, oh. you but know, you, I got there. I yeah, got there. You certainly did. So have you ever, do you remember uh, the atmosphere being like it is today? Uh, I remember in 1989 when uh, Operation Rescue invaded. Oh, when they came to oh God, yes. And they were, you know, I, I was in waiting rooms of, uh, of another clinic in the city where a couple of people had chained themselves around the ne their neck to a kryptonite block, a priest and two other people, and were screaming at the patients. You're not going to be having your abortions today. There'll be no abortions today. And we had to call the police. It took two hours to get them out of that kryptonite block. I remember uh, George Tiller, my friend, being shot in the head in church. Yeah, it, it's been, this has been a hot war for a very, very long time. But the political people then were supporting you. Not At least the political uh, people around uh, here. No. Some of them, some no, of them. You know, so. you know, you know. For a very long time, people were like, "Oh, there goes Hoffman again. She's out there. They're never yeah. going. They're never going to overturn Roe." Oh, come on, or you know. yeah. Well, you look at the latest poll. What's the most important issue for women? Abortion. Okay, so, and what are we on the cusp of? The overturning of Roe. I hate to say I told yeah. you so, but no, that's <laughs> right. But we go back now to the economics. Yes. Um, there's a gap in in the polling, women and, and men, but and abortion is the issue. But then they keep telling us that that gap is narrowing, and Romney is there preaching economics and yes. jobs. Yes. But you've put it all together. Uh, yeah. I, as I said, I call it uh, uh, abortion uh, abortionomics because if the family is not strong, and the mother and father or, or the unit is not working, right. then they are not going to be able to have children. They're going to make a decision of abortion. So you want to look at the economics in terms of what will support the country, what will support women's decisions to have children. The ability to have health insurance will support that. The ability to have adequate education will support that. The the ability to have daycare will support that, not the ability to say a Darwinian kind of, all right, well, you go out and take care of yourself. Yeah. That, you know, <laughs> that's not going to support a, a, a pronatal society. Right. So what are we going to do about it? Well, I hope that we're going to, uh, I, I hope we're going to elect Obama, but I also, beyond this election, there is the day after, and what has to be done is that women themselves have to get active. They have to realize that freedom is not free, and it is every one of our responsibility to make this kind of the kind of country that we want. We can't sit back and say, "Well, he'll take care of it or she'll take." We have to take care. And of that it. brings so, us to uh, your website and your magazine online which is called Choices? No, it's called oh. On the Issues. On the Issues. The Progressive Women's Quarterly. Sorry. On the right. Issues Magazine .com. And the, and the focus this month is, is the, the day, day after. after. So tell us about it. Well, the focus is, as I said, um, whomever wins this election, it is really up to each and, each and every one of us to ensure that this country is the kind of country that we want. And I think it does have that vision of something, you know, the shining city on the hill, but it has to shine its light on all of us. So we have to make that happen. When you go, do you speak at colleges also? Some, some. And do you find that the students are enthusiastic? I find they're, they're very responsive to me, but you know, Young this men is- Young also? Some, yes, but this is the people that are in my audience. I mean, <laughs> it's not, it's yeah. not everyone. I mean, there are a lot of young feminists out there. There are a lot of young feminists that are active online, yeah. active in campuses. 
you know, and uh, we just had pro-choice escorts. There are uh, quite a few young people, which gives but me hope. They, do you think they're lacking a historical yes. perspective? Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, history is critical in understanding where you are in the process and trying not to have to recreate the wheel because, you know, uh, how much time are we going to waste with this? <laughs> there are lessons to be learned, and of course, the times are different. But, uh, you know, now I think because we didn't really look at history enough, we're in this situation where you have officials sitting up there, standing up there and say, oh, I'd be delighted to overturn Roe v. Wade. Or Tom Walsh is up there saying, oh, women never die from, from uh, pregnancies. I mean, now everybody has an MD, and they're making these extraordinary statements that are totally untrue, and yet nobody's there to it's say, it. <laughs> stop. Yeah. You know, interesting. you know, so, so it's, a, it's a dangerous time when, when you have a, a faith-based reality that really can't be challenged and you don't have enough people checking the facts or aware of the history to say, oh, no, no, that's not true. That's not true. So uh, we've got to expand our outreach or something. Uh, yes, and, uh -huh. but, but uh, we have to expand the outreach, but the people, the young people, have to themselves be activated and motivated to meet us, if not halfway, 40 percent, you know. But we can't go 10, you know, 90 percent. They have to be there. They have to be willing. They have to be able to, uh, to turn around and say, yes, it matters. I want to be involved. And the young women who come in for abortions, yeah. do they become activists? No, very few. They just want to, they, they would like to come into like. the doctor's office without it having to be a military maneuver, get yes. treated without being yelled at, and go home. Very often they want to put it behind them because there's so much shame that people still put around this issue. I mean, they don't, they don't leave and say, okay, now sign me up. You know, it would be good, but that's not what's happening. Well, we've come to the end of this, so oh. I would like people who are watching us to read your book, which okay, is thank called you. Intimate Wars, right. and to go on the internet and look at the magazine, which is called On, on the, the Issues. Issues. And um, it's got so much information on it that sometimes you may just want to print it out. But anyway, <laughs> and, and to go to Merle's website, which is MerleHoffman.com. Um, simple enough. And uh, you will be inspired and educated. Thank you. And carry on, right? Absolutely. Do Thank the work. You. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.